so I'll go with you guys. Cool. All right. All right. How y'all doing? Ooh. Oh, <laughs> that's very energetic for Sunday. You, you get one move. Yeah. yeah. Only one <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Um, I know, you know, Sunday noon talks are hard sometimes. So uh, we appreciate you guys sticking around. Uh, this is Spy versus Spy, tips from the trenches for red and blue teams. Um, Josh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so a couple of things that we're going to be going over today. Uh, we're going to go through a few pretty common but still pretty effective attack scenarios and kind of show a phased approach for those attacks. So we're going to talk about the basic attack and then what the defense might look like for that and then how you kind of ramp that attack up a little bit, back and forth, so on and so forth, kind of demonstrate that cat and mouse nature that we often see between, you know, offense and defense. So, a little bit about us. So I'm Thomas McVee. We're on Twitter at Tefanis. I'm a security or a senior analyst with Secure State, primary, primary rec, uh, for defense. Primary responsibility. I'm Jeff uh, Jamcut on Twitter, also at Secure Stay, and primarily responsible for the offensive side. So before we jump right into the scenarios, um, how many of you are familiar with the NIST CSF? I mentioned a couple, a couple hands going up. Cool. Okay. So if you're not familiar with it, I'm not going to get into like great level of detail about it, but just understand that it's a it's a framework for managing cybersecurity risk. These are the the five phases that it kind of goes through. Um, and you can kind of see that you can you can pretty easily break those five phases up into two groups, proactive and reactive. Um, so the one second, guys. You go back a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Microphone is, uh, excuse this audio gap, but. Uh, okay. Whoops. Do I go back a slide? Is that better? So, number one, if you're going to stand away, please use that. Okay. Or pass. Okay. And, and this one I just needed to be out, so it was behind here, which. Thank you. Gotcha. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, go over this again real quick, but basically uh, these would be the, the five phases of the NIST CSF, uh, further broken down into two groups, proactive and reactive. So um, we're going to talk about, through this conversation, a couple of, of different phases here and kind of look at different ways to maybe consider your defensive strategy. Um, so the, the protective defenses would be things that you do to limit the... Uh, limit the ability to be breached, right? So these are things you're going to do up front to shore up your defenses, make yourself stronger, kind of the classic, you know, harden the perimeter sort of things. Um, all kind of proactive. And then uh, the detect phase would be uh, what you can do after the effect. Uh, if a breach does occur, how you can determine that a breach has occurred uh, in a timely manner and what you can do to respond to that. So those are kind of the two classifications. Uh, so with that out of the way, the three attacks that we're going to be covering today, everyone should be pretty familiar, but phishing, malicious devices, and password attacks. So we'll jump right into phishing. Um, like I said, everyone's probably aware of what this is by now, right? But uh, it's social engineering, specifically through email. Uh, there could be any number of different results. Most often we're trying to capture credentials or maybe trying to get a shell on our target. And like many other things in information security, it's often associated with very bad stock images. <laughs> All right, so for basic defenses, uh, when it comes down to phishing and phishing awareness, is basically going to be your user awareness training. Um, a lot of times what we see is like normal training campaigns are using way out-of-date material. You know, we're all pretty well familiar with the uh, Nigerian print scams. Uh, a lot of people still actually use this in their user awareness training. So let's quit utilizing those type of images. Let's start thinking like an attacker would a red team it yourself. Start thinking critically about how you're going to train your users up um, by using real world scenarios. Also, up your game when you're doing this. Don't water this down for your C stack. Uh, you want to make this as realistic as possible. Start, start focusing on things like creating a sense of urgency, requesting that sensitive information. Get those emotions stirring when you send those uh, when you send the fish out. Also, try modifying your center domain to look legitimate. Okay, so um, originally we came with like a pretty basic fish, right? Uh, the the guy with the mallet. Um, Tom's got some defensive strategies in place, some user awareness. So it's our job now to send a better fish, right? Uh, what we have to really do is some maybe some in-depth research, social and technical. We have to make our fish as convincing as possible. Um, there's a lot of interesting lures on John Lambert's Twitter. If you're not following him and you do social engineering, that's probably an account worth checking out. He posts a lot of interesting stuff up there, a lot of stuff that you may be able to reuse or modify for your own fishing campaigns. Um, 
these are a couple of images maybe of what we would consider like a better pretext, right? This is some of the templates that we have in the Kingfisher tool, uh, but things that have like realistic styling behind them that look, you know, presentable and professional uh, and not just something that was kind of slapped together and, and shot out to, you know, company name dash all. Okay, so as we start to send off that better fish, we need to start looking at ways that we can prevent that fish from achieving, uh, getting access to our users. We want to start introducing different technical controls that we could put in place. So things like Center Policy Framework or DKIM, Domain Keys Identified Mail. Um, you could also look at things like transport rules. So is anybody familiar with these technologies? Everybody should be pretty well aware of them by now. They're pretty, uh, pretty common. But uh, Center Policy Framework, for those that aren't, uh, is a Basically, it's, a, it's another DNS type of record that you can put in place to identify who has access to send mail on behalf of your domain. Um, a lot of times what we see from the defensive standpoint as we're looking at or from the attack, uh, attack standpoint is a lot of our, a lot of times when you see an SPF record, you see like a soft fail or just the pass all in there. You really need to kind of suck this up, guys, and just put in the, the hard fail. Um, there's really no reason why you would need a soft fail for an SPF record. Uh, if anybody is not sure how to create the SPF record, there's uh, the SPF wizard. It walks you through the process. Pretty standard, pretty pretty easy to follow along with. And if you ever need to check, if you're not doing it like an NS lookup, you could also use uh, Kitterman's site to validate that the, that your SPF record is in place and functional. Uh, domain keys identified mail. Uh, it's kind of like your public and private keys for for uh, for your mail systems. Um, again, this is another DNS type record. Um, where you, you send off your message, it gets encrypted with your private key, and then the receiving end looks up your public key and uh, your DNS record. Also, exchange transport, transport rules. Um, if you haven't really played with transport rules too much, uh, these are very effective. It, it really It's very similar to Outlook rules that the client would see, uh, but you can put these in place, of course, to route uh, your, your mail the way you wish to. So start looking at things like, how can I black hole top level domains that are not, um, you know, that of course like dot corn here, uh, where we don't want to allow that to go through uh, to our users. So start thinking of things like, okay, hey, can I generate uh, domains based off of my domain that re closely resemble and start black holing those as they come in? Okay. So we have some technical controls in place now in the environment. Um, now it's our job to see what we can do to maybe circumvent those controls. So. Uh, one thing you might want to consider uh, is just maybe sending a meeting invite instead of a actual message, right? So this would be something that drops in. I don't know about you guys. I know when I get calendar invites, a lot of times I'm just like, accept, 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 because I have 20 other things going on and I'll get to it later. Um, we've had pretty good success with this, sending that in, uh, you know, and our targets reacting the same way, especially if you have kind of a longer term engagement. Uh, you can put, you can get one of these in place, get it on the calendar, and then, you know, maybe a week or so down the line, uh, after it's kind of out of the client's mind, it pops up. They're like, oh crap, I have a meeting. Let me join that meeting. And then they get presented with, you know, a login page. Obviously, they'll have to, you know, use their company creds to log in. Uh, maybe they have to download a browser extension to enable the screen sharing of the presentation. So there's a lot of, you know, creative things you can do with something like that. Tom mentioned the .corn domain, um, the, or the TLD, rather, if you guys haven't tried something like that. Obviously, the, the technique here is that it looks like calm at a first glance, but it's not. So uh, you can, a lot of times you have good success getting that into the environment if it hasn't been black holed uh, through a technical control. Uh, you can also use some other tools here. So a couple links that are up here is uh, expireddomains.net and uh, who is your daddy. So uh, Here's a screenshot, which hopefully you guys can see at least a little bit. But basically, uh, expireddomains.net, you can search for uh, a keyword, and it'll come basically with a list of domains that have that word in it uh, that have been expired. You can maybe go snap one of those domains up, and it's going to have some domain history, some age behind it, uh, maybe you know some things that some of those third-party controls might see and then be more willing to allow mail to come through from a domain like that. Uh, Who is your daddy is kind of similar. It'll search for, uh, take a list of domains and show you ones that have expired or will expire soon. So you can be a little bit proactive about it. Okay. Can you always check to see if the domain has been blacklisted already because you wouldn't want to purchase one of those that had Right. Who is your daddy does not. Sorry. Uh, so the question was, do those tools check to see if the domain has been blacklisted? Uh, who is your daddy does not. I know because I wrote that one. Um, the expireddomains.net will give you a um, spam score on the domain 
Uh, I don't recall if it'll tell you if it's been explicitly blacklisted or not, but you can get the score and kind of react accordingly. My nice thing is you can always just check the RBLs by a spam hoss or something else to, to see. Okay. So the next step, kind of introducing those, uh, yeah, actually, after we've already taken care of user awareness training, we've introduced our technical controls. We really need to just kind of start passing the risk off to somebody else. And this is where your third-party controls really come into play. Uh, things like Microsoft's Advanced Threat Protection and Mimecast. Um, I know there's been a couple of talks over this weekend that kind of talk to uh, how how these fun uh, third-party controls work. Uh, there's some bypasses, but it's always good to kind of layer that technology on top of each other, really give you that that. Uh, detection type mechanism in place. Um, Microsoft's Advanced Threat Protection and Mimecast as well, they both do very similar uh, techniques where they look for uh, suspicious content and they kind of put that into a detonation chamber to see how it reacts. Um, uh, they also check for things like uh, when's the last time the domain, or when was the domain registered, how long has it been active, uh, what kind of content's being passed through to the, uh, to the domain itself. So anytime you can kind of pass that risk off, you're going to be a little bit better. Okay, so finally our, our best attack, the, the shark with the laser. Um, if we're still intent on getting a payload into the environment maybe for an attack like this and uh, we've got some more advanced technical controls in place, things that are going to be uh, inspecting attachments uh, real time and making determination based on their activity, uh, you could you could use some sneaky payloads, right? So you might obfuscate your payload to break uh, signatures or, or uh, detection-based rules. Uh, you could encrypt your payload. You key it to a specific user or domain. Uh, the key gets pulled from an environment variable uh, when it lands. It decrypts and executes. So, I mean, this has been talked about a few times before, but if the uh, sandbox is running your payload, it's most likely not domain joined. So when it pulls the domain environment variable, payload doesn't decrypt correctly, therefore doesn't execute. Everything looks good. We get to get delivered to the inbox. When it runs on the user system, the domain's correct. It decrypts correctly. You get a shell. So uh, some things like that are uh, some ways that you can get that payload in. You could also look at maybe hosting the payload online uh, and delivering a link instead of actually delivering an attachment in the mail. Uh, that has added benefits as well. It all depends on the scenario. Okay. All right, so uh, some, some of the detection techniques that we can kind of put in place for this. Again, we were talking about earlier uh, using uh, exchange transport rules and also some black holing of our domains based upon the seed domain itself. So as you start to key in on some of this information as it's coming in, um, start throwing those to your logs, start parsing through those logs and see what you can react to. Um, anytime you can kind of do that aggregation across the logs, it's going to be better off for you. Cool. Okay, so first attack down, on to the next. This is malicious devices. Uh, these are media devices that are used to entice users to plug them in and compromise their own system for you. Uh, usually USB device at this point. Way back in the day, they used to rely on auto run attacks, but that's pretty much gone now. Uh, basic attacks at this point in time are going to typically use maybe Microsoft Office files with a macro in them, or maybe just a straight up executable payload on the flash drive itself. Okay, so this one here is pretty pretty stock standard, right? It's been around for a while, disabling things like auto run and macros for the end users themselves. Uh, Microsoft's got some great group policies, uh, walkthroughs on how to do this, um, especially with Office 2016 now. This this uh, link in the in the slide here really kind of speaks to blocking out the macros from anything that's coming in from the internet uh, to the user's inbox. So if you get a chance to look at the slides later on, definitely check out that walkthrough. It's very good, but uh. Basically, using group policy objects to uh, just denote who and what macros are allowed to to uh, to execute based on where they're coming from. All right, so if we're going to stop, you know, auto run, we're going to stop macros. Maybe as an attacker, it's time to just stop with the executable payloads in general, right? So maybe not something that they just double click on and and get owned, but something else, something different. We'd say maybe go with a HID attack. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that's a human interface device. A lot of options to perform this attack. The, probably the most classic example is the rubber ducky. Uh, the Bash Bunny is kind of the new hot one right now. A couple other options as well. But basically, this is a device that you plug in. It's going to act like a, a keyboard, and it's going to start typing out commands and keyboard shortcuts on your behalf. Probably is going to run like a maybe a PowerShell one-liner or some other type of command to download and execute a file. 
All right. So how do we start blocking this kind of attack vector? Uh, this is where your user awareness training is really going to come back into play. So we are kind of put in some of the technical controls ahead of time to try to prevent some of that. But really, this is where you, you need to really speak down to the user's level. Start looking at it as uh, how is this going to affect the end user in their current environment, right? If you can't make them understand why this is a risk for them, they're never going to take that training seriously. So you need to really sit down, focus, say, okay, hey, in accounting, you process accounting type information, right? That's all our financials. It's how the money comes in and out of the business. You probably should be a little bit more aware of what's going on. Um, so don't plug in those those devices. You can also start doing other technical controls like control, uh, control the device installation based upon the device class. Uh, there's a couple of other good walkthroughs on MSDN uh, on how to do this. And they also have a list of available class devices where you can start blocking those out through group policy objects. Okay, so um, yeah, right. Probably don't do that. But that's that's kind of the point. We're we're so we're going to we're using that rubber ducky as an example here for this. Um, Tom's trained his users now. They're they're not trying to plug in just random devices they pick up off the ground. So it's our job as an attacker to make that even harder for them to resist, right? Maybe they're not just going to pick up some you know unassuming flash drive, but if we can kind of sex that up a little bit and make it harder for them to resist that, we might have a greater chance. So. Walk through a couple images here, but this is a standard rubber ducky. If no one's uh, ever used one, you crack it open. There's the little PCB inside, but it's pretty uh, unassuming, uh, pretty generic-looking flash drive. Uh, however, how could we spruce this up? Well, there's a company called FlashBay. I'm sure there's many others like it, but they do, you know, branded USBs for marketing and, and promotional giveaways and things like that. Uh, but they're actually super helpful if you call them up and ask for a demo kit. They'll send you this thing. And it's got a lot of the different form factors with the company logos and stuff on there. Um, side note that the flash drives that they'll send you are not actually functional, um, but it's pretty easy to just crack open the housings on them and stick your own PCB inside. So next slide. That's what we've done here. We've taken one. Uh, that's the stock ducky on the left. And as you can see, it was just a little bit too wide to fit into this housing. Not really a problem. You take a little strip of sandpaper and grind off the edge just a little bit and fits in there. Good to go. So we take that. We slap it on a keychain with some keys, a car key. Um, and now we've got something that looks a lot more realistic. It looks like maybe someone might have dropped their keys in the parking lot. And we know that people want to be helpful. Uh, they're going to pick this up and think, well, hey, maybe somebody lost their keys. They're not going to be able to get home. It's a Friday. I, I need to turn these in. Maybe I'll plug it in and see if I can figure out who these belong to. Maybe I'll give it to the receptionist, the lost and found, whatever it is. But it, the better it looks, the more likely that someone's going to want to interact with it. Okay. Anybody here try to standardize hardware yet across your organization? No? Awesome. Uh, uh, hey, I don't blame you. It's hard. I mean, this is something that's very hard, but this is a great technical control that you could put in place. Um, oftentimes what we see is larger organizations who have the budget, who can constantly get the same type of hardware, have so many resources available to them, but yet they can't get this done because they have so many resources available. Uh, oftentimes you see uh, some of the younger organizations or, you know, small to medium sized businesses uh, that don't have a lot of the, the human resources available to implement this across, but they could start uh, with uh, the budget, start planning ahead for this. But standardizing your hardware, basically you're, you're going to allow only those specific keyboards, only those specific, uh, specific mice to have access to your systems themselves. <clears throat> And again, there's another link there for TechNet that kind of walks you through a little bit of this. It's uh, going to be a lot of trial and error, but once you get it, it's pretty pretty solid. All right, so what are some de detection techniques that we can utilize for things like malicious devices? We can start introducing device monitoring uh, in our environment. Now, this is going to be a very, again, very time-consuming type of control that you put in place. So you really want to start identifying high-risk systems in your environment that you can start placing these uh, controls in, into. Things like the reception desk, accounting, um, even HR, where you want to kind of put in that internal segmentation across your network. You really want to start focusing on how we can do some of the detection here. So a couple of programs here like USD View is a great tool for monitoring USB activity. Uh, I didn't take a screenshot here, but every time you plug it in, it will recognize that, hey, a new device has been plugged in. It gives you device class, the device ID, all that type of information. But the nice thing about the tool is it allows you to uh, generate commands upon the device insertion. So as you plug in a new keyboard, you can have it execute, hey, drop this uh, event log 
identifier into our system event log, which then hopefully you're forwarding over to your SIM for or aggregation tool. You could also use make use of uh, PowerShell. Uh, a real quick little blip here for it. You know, go through uh, WMI. Uh, check out your Win32 keyboard class. Uh, I don't know if you can really see that screenshot there, but as you uh, you continuously monitor this, you want to watch for those changes. So as you dump in this out to like a database or another log file, you want to see if there's any changes. Uh, and if you do, alert through your SIM uh, that way. Okay. So onto the third attack here. Uh, this is passwords. This is one of the most common attacks uh, and one of the most successful ones, right? Because we're using valid user credentials for nefarious purposes. So uh, this has a huge attack surface. Uh, when we're talking about internet facing systems, this is essentially anything that ties to Active Directory. That's gonna be the most common targets. Um, and obviously because you usually have the highest payoff when you're going after those. Uh, Passwords obviously can compromise in several ways, right? You could guess them. Um, we're going to focus on that here with, you know, maybe summer 17, maybe, you know, fall uh, 2017, something like that right now. You could have a hash that you've obtained in some way, maybe from a public dump that you've cracked. But ultimately, uh, you're going to use the actual user's credentials to perform an action as that user. All right, so what are some of the basic defenses that we can have for passwords? Uh, I don't know if... I know it's no longer the draft. I updated this in my other slide deck, grabbed the wrong one, so I apologize. Um, but it is in uh, revision dash three now, so 863 dash three. But this is where they really start to talk to uh, which and how you want to uh, apply your password policy. So, really, again, as we've been saying it for how many years now, let's start focusing on password, pol uh, password phrases instead of passwords. Um, they are complex. Easy to remember, and as you can see here, I'm a DerbyCon fanboy. Uh, that's a 25 character passphrase. That's pretty complex, but it's very easy to remember. So I can quickly type that in. I've seen a couple of organizations uh, utilize this recently. Um, it has some really awesome passwords. It was, it was kind of funny, um, but yeah, the more you push this out, the more you talk to your users, the better off it's going to be. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but. I think that that guy with the 25 character passphrase with like four complexity types, he's probably an overachiever in all honesty. Um, so most organizations that we see are sticking with the, you know, the Microsoft recommended eight characters with three complexity types. And that's kind of where their, their baseline is. Um, so as an organization, when you think about increasing, um, what happens is a lot of times someone will make the decision, well, we'll just bump it up a couple characters. We'll make it a little bit harder. The problem is when you're guessing passwords like that. So we say we go from eight, you know, from eight characters to 10 characters. Well, now I'm going to guess summer 2017 instead of summer 17, right? Um, so what happens? We, you know, we do that. We come back next year. They say, oh, the passwords weren't strong enough. We'll bump it up again. We'll go to 12 characters. Well, maybe this is like a contrived example, but company name one, right? Uh, so, we still are able to guess passwords and you kind of iterate over this over and over again. And, you know, the, as an organization, you're like, well, we just, apparently it's not strong enough. We'll just keep making the password stronger. Ultimately, um, you know, you keep bumping it up. People are going to still find passwords that are guessable or even worst case scenario, you have accounts that uh, are set to never have the password change, service accounts and stuff like that, that aren't getting these updated password policy requirements when you change them. And so we can still guess, you know, the username as the password and, and get in a lot of times like that with some old account that people forgot about. So you can go back and forth, back and forth between red and blue, password length and complexity, but ultimately uh, you reach a, a decision and that is. We're going to start looking at different things like multi-factor authentication. Um, Again, you're going to have to really take a risk-based approach on this type of uh, technical control and, and identify where you can apply multi-factor authentication. Where does it make sense? So maybe things like OWA, RDP, uh, VPNs, of course. Anything that you're going to have that's externally facing that you can add this additional layer in is going to be best. Uh, that's where it's going to be best implemented. Um, and again, that's going to really determine how you do the implementation for multi-factor authentication. Um, Internally, we've seen some additional steps uh, for multi-factor uh, inside maybe doing things for, because since you can't really control SMB activity, you can't put another form of authentication around SMB, but you can do things like, hey, can we PGP encrypt this drive and then set up those keys against those. So identify your high-risk data, segment it off internally, and then apply those controls around, around your data. Okay, so from the attacker's perspective, like Tom said, uh, they've, they've deployed multi-factor auth at this point. Um, but I gotta be honest, as an attacker, 
when we come up against multi-factor auth, a lot of times that that kills our ability to get into whatever you know service that is protecting, right? So uh, most commonly we see this on a VPN, rightfully so. Um, so as an attacker, you have to look to other places. Like Tom said, you can't deploy it to every single service at once. That's expensive. That's uh, time consuming. It's you know prone to errors. So it's up to us as an attacker to find where the weak spots are still. So look at things like file sharing applications. Uh, look at things like Link or Skype. Uh, OWA is a huge target and one that we don't see uh, multi-factor deployed on very often. Um, if you do have access to OWA and there is a multi-factor uh, on the login page, you could still look at using a tool like Ruler uh, to gain access through another protocol like Mappy or the RPC interface that doesn't have that multi-factor authentication enabled. And then from there, you can uh, you know obtain a shell or uh, you know send a message as that user, an internal fish, and just kind of expand the breadth of your compromise at that point. So it's really about identifying where your target has not been able to deploy that multi-factor auth and then specifically drilling down on those services. Three minutes. All right. All right, we'll probably run through this real quick. Um, we only got three minutes left. So detection techniques for, for, these, uh, for login and authentication. Uh, anybody here familiar with NetLogon or using the, the diagnostic tools? Awesome. So enabling the net logon debug mode allows you to really track failed network authentication, things of that nature. So as, as you know, the attackers hit you with a fish, they gain access to the environment. Uh, this is going to help you pinpoint where that's actually originating from inside your environment. Uh, NL test is the tool that you want to use and there's a DB flag. Um, watch how quickly this thing, uh, fills up for the logging aspect. It, it does fill up very quickly on your domain controllers. All right, so as part of this, we kind of walk through and you start to see that, hey, there's a lot of trending that's going on here. And what you really see is, again, a major, major focus on user awareness training as well as uh, technical controls. So it's kind of where that bounce back is around the whole slide deck itself, but really focusing on that user awareness training and talking to your users and go, hey, this is why risk applies to you. Um, is what you've really seen here. A lot of this all kind of falls back into our protect phase back in the CSF itself. So as you're going through and you start to see these attacks and all the controls that we're putting in place, they all kind of fall along that protect uh, protect line. Uh, we're, we really want to start focusing on how to detect these types of attacks. And just want to run through it real quick just so we can kind of get some questions if you guys have any questions. Um, but again, thanks to the DerbyCon organizers and Emily for putting putting together our slide deck. But uh, that pretty much wraps it up. Does anybody actually have questions? I would love to have a little bit of open dialogue. Yeah, we can have them outside. If anybody has any questions, that'd be great. Okay. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it.